Good morning. Hey, it's great to have you here. My name is Pastor Nate, and I want to welcome you, whether you're worshiping with us online right now uh, or whether you're gathered here together on the Summit campus. Um, isn't it great to sing some Christmas songs and start getting ready for this season? And it's good to be together. And in fact, this series that we're doing here right now, I, I believe can be incredibly helpful for you personally and for your family as well. Uh, it is a series that we are focused on right now, preparing for Christmas. Uh, and it is called Fear Not, because um, all throughout the Christmas story, there are these moments as they were getting ready for Christmas, as Jesus was about to be born, angels would often appear and say those very words, do not fear, do not be afraid because God is with you. And there's some incredible things that God wants you to know. And so each week in the series, we're looking at some different moments, what that meant for them in the story, what it also can mean for you in your life and faith as well. The first week we talked about how Mary had to wrestle with that question. And, and maybe you've had some fears about that in your life as well, sometimes wondering, what is God going to ask me to do? And am I ready for what he's asking? Uh, this week, the question's going to be a little bit different, but you can see this in the story of Joseph. He, along with Mary, also had to come to terms with this idea that, that they would be raising uh, the Messiah, that Jesus would be born into their family. But, but he also dealt with something that is a challenge for many other people in our world today. Maybe it is for you as well. And it's this question, what will people think? See, Joseph, as you'll see in this story here, had a big decision to make. Does he go ahead and get married to his fiance? Does he call things off? And, and maybe in your life, as you think about um, growing up as a kid, Maybe there are some different ways that early on for you, you, you thought, you know, what are other people going to think? Maybe it was the right clothes that you wore, whether you had the right brand. Maybe it was while you were in elementary school or middle school or high school. You had a lot of sensitivity to different cliques and different groups of people on campus. And can I find my place? And, and what does that person who's popular think about me? Or what does that mean? Uh, maybe some of you as parents have had a, a conversation with your kids that sounds something like this, mom or dad, everyone at my school has the newest iPhone. What do you mean you're not going to get that for me? I'll be the only one that has one that's four years old or has a different brand. Uh, maybe as you've gotten older, maybe you don't care about some of those kinds of things, but for you, like what people think of you with your work or career is really important to you. Maybe like where you live or the car that you drive, you actually care about what people think more sometimes than you even realize. And if you've ever taken a picture and you've gone to post it on Facebook or Instagram, and you've decided, no, that's not going to work. Let's try that over again. It's natural for us to care what people will think, yes? And so Joseph had one of those kinds of moments for him where all of a sudden he had to, he had to, to answer his wife and figure out what he was going to do. We're going to Matthew chapter 1, so I encourage you to open your Bible. Go ahead and take a look there if you have it with you. Uh, you're welcome to follow along on the screen or on the app here as well. But this is where this portion of the Christmas story begins. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to imagine for just a, a moment what that conversation might have been like when Mary went to go talk to Joseph, because the angel appeared to her, not to him. That hadn't happened yet. And 
Imagine her saying, Joseph, hey, sit down. Um, hey, is it a question about the wedding or something going on? No, just uh, I want to talk with you about something. I'm pregnant, and it's not your kid. He's like, no kidding, it's not my kid. What in the world is going on? And she shares about this angel and this message from God and what, what God was asking her to do. And the Bible says that Joseph was a righteous man, so he was a man of faith. But imagine just for a moment from the human side what that, what that must have been like for him. You know, on one hand thinking, I know Mary. We're engaged. I'm getting to know her. And, and maybe what she's saying is true. She's never given me a reason not to trust her. But on the other hand, man, that is just an incredible story. How can I ever know if that's the truth or not? In fact, there's this guy that lives like six doors down, young guy. I see the way he looks at Mary. Like, I just, I wonder, did something happen? And is this just the most spiritual cover story I've ever heard and do I trust her or not? What do I do? And even if it's true, do I go through with it? What do I do? And, and he weighed all those options. And in fact, you have to understand this in that context. It's a little bit different for someone who was getting engaged 2,000 years ago in the Middle East. Um, it was not just a private proposal to marry. Oftentimes, both families were involved in that conversation and, and there was probably an introduction arranged by the, the parents for the two of them to be able to meet before the engagement. And, and so it was not as simple as him saying, Mary, would you just give me the ring back? And I, I just don't think this is a good idea. I don't think this is going to work. This was a public deal. Both of their families were involved. And this was a, a small town kind of kind of area. Everybody knew each other in that place. And, and so for, for Joseph, one of the other things that would have been unique for him, likely at this time, is that when an engagement was, was official, it was usually about a year until you got married. And one of the things that the guy had to do was help to build the house and the room and the space where his new bride would come and live. And so if you've ever been up to Arizona and you've looked at some like early ruins or things here, um, you just looked at, at some of the going back a thousand years ago and you can see kind of the evidence of homes that were built. Often they're built in a very clan and relationship oriented kind of way that you'll see maybe kind of a central space but a home that's built and then something that's added on and another room that's added on and another room that's added on. Jesus even talked about this once with his disciples when he talked about going to heaven. He said, I'm going to go to heaven and I will prepare a place for you so that when, I'm come, when I come back, it'll be ready for you. And, and there was this, this piece that was common, a part of marriage, that the guy would build and get the house ready so that when the marriage happened, that, that the fiance, that Mary would come and move in. And good news for them is Joseph was was going to be a carpenter. So he probably had some skills and was building a great place. This thing was half done, and all of a sudden now he gets this bomb dropped on him by Mary. What's he supposed to do? Verse 19, it goes on this way. It says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. He just decided, look, I don't think I can go through with this. And yet he was trying to be as kind to her as possible. If he really wanted to get off the hook, if he thought she must have been with another guy and it's not my kid, he could have thrown her under the bus, said, look, it's not my kid. Might have been helpful for him in terms of trying to make a new start after that, but, but he loved this woman decided to call it off, tried to break the engagement quietly. But, but no doubt as he navigated through this, he wrestled with that question, what will people think of me? What will Mary think of me? 
depending upon what I do? What will, what will my friends and neighbors think of me, depending upon what I do, especially if I decide to marry her and go through with this? Look, people are going to talk. They can add up the calendar. They know when this baby was about to arrive. What will people think of me? And there's a few different challenges that that Joseph would have had to face if he had chosen to go forward with moving her. Challenges either way, but some of the potential ones for him there were social stigma. So in that culture and in that time, uh, it was in the Middle East, just like today, a high value on honor and, and shame, that you don't ever want to do something to bring shame to your family. You don't want to. You want to do things the right way. And so the social stigma for him there would have been in that town, a lot of people talking and wondering, hey, what do you think the story is with Mary and Joseph and what happened, especially if Jesus was born and didn't look a lot like him? Um, People might have whispered about the timing and how this happened and, hey, did you hear how they had to move up their wedding and what took place? And, and in that setting and in that culture, um, it would have had ripple effects for, for them, um, even more so than we can possibly understand here today. Potentially some rejection by their family or by friends. Um, his dad, for instance, um, his dad might have seen even as they explained this to him, might have said, look, this is just not the way that, this is not the way that this should work, and I'm not willing to give my blessing to your marriage now. May have had, may have had family or friends that simply didn't understand. There may have been some financial strain for him, because in a small community like that where everybody knows everybody and what family you're from. If you were a carpenter in that town, you are not selling your furniture on Facebook Marketplace or putting an ad on Google. So it is a very private transaction with somebody that doesn't even know you. If there are people that are whispering and talking, it's like, hey, man, what do you think about this guy Joseph? And and. And do you think that he's even the dad of this kid and what's going on and all that? It would have been very easy in that context for someone to say, hey, why don't we just go to the carpenter on the other side of Nazareth? Could have been all kinds of impact for him personally and not to discount personally in his own head, in the back of his mind, some of the personal doubts of of what that means. And again, without hearing a message from God and from the angel personally, like what do you, th can I ever really trust Mary? How do I know this was true? The cool thing is that the angel did appear to him and shared some incredible things. And, and in verse 20, it says this, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, the angel said, say it with me, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife. In the heart of this Christmas story, over and over, we hear these words, do not be afraid because God is with you and his hand is on you and his promise is with you. For this child within her that your wife is now carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so the angel encouraged him to be able to take Mary home as his wife, but, but he was about to learn one of life's most important lessons that you may have learned at some point along the way as well. Um, but for Joseph, it came into focus in a very tight way for him that if he chose to move forward to marry Mary, he was going to have to trust God in some really significant ways. And, and that would need to be enough for him. He would come to this point of realizing there that pleasing God often means disappointing people. That pleasing God often means disappointing people. And for Joseph, I believe in the Christmas story with that message, not to be afraid. Um, this is something that can be incredibly powerful for you. It can be incredibly powerful for your family. 
if you have kids or you have grandkids, this can be one of the most transformative things that if they will believe God's promises for them, who Jesus says they are, and find confidence and courage in that, um, that pleasing God, recognizing sometimes that will mean disappointing people, I believe can be a game changer for them. So for instance, think about Think about some of our kids and students here at Summit as we pour into the next generation here. Uh, one of the things we want to help um, young people learn and grab a hold of is, is who God says they are and what it means that you are a son of God, what it means that you are forgiven, that you're a follower of Jesus, that God is a, a part of your life. Um, that is incredibly important for the first time and in many times to follow after that, when your son or daughter is going to have a conversation with some friends, and all of a sudden they're going to have some pretty intense peer pressure to give in and to do something and to make a compromise that God certainly doesn't want for them, that, that you probably don't want for them as a, a parent there either. And even at a young age, they're going to have some of those things where they say, look, if I stay true to my faith or I... I'm loyal to God right now. It means that some of my friends are not going to understand or get or might even make fun of me. And yet there is something profound and life-changing and so good for a child when they figure that out. And it might have happened for you or for your kids when you were seven years old or when you were 13 years old to be able to understand and come to a point where you realize, look, that that I'm going to care more about what God thinks than what other people think. I'm telling you, when something clicks in their brain, when something clicks in your brain, because it m might not have happened when you were a kid, it might not have happened when you were 21, or when you were 41, or you were 71. It can happen at any point along the way in your life, but there is something incredible that God will do in your life and in your future um, when you come to the point there of saying, hey, as for me and my family, um, we'll serve the Lord. And, and I believe that God's promises are better than what this world has to offer. And I believe that what God thinks is more important than what others might think. And so in Matthew chapter 1, the angel goes on to lean into this. And there, and there are moments where, where as you you put God first in your life that other people will struggle to understand that. You might have some friends that, let's say, that you're becoming a more committed Christian or that time came for you where you said, my faith's really important to me. And all of a sudden, you've got some friends now that are saying, look, you, you're just different than you used to be. Maybe you're, you've been committed to a growth group and you're wanting to grow in your faith and build some Christian community to do something a little bit different in your life maybe even just prioritizing worship on Saturday or on Sunday and, and being a part of that every weekend. You've, you've got some friends that are now saying to you, look, you're just not the same person that you used to be. You used to be the first one to say, hey, there's an adventure, I'm up for this now, and it, it just seems like you've got, and I know we still hang out, but you've got some different priorities in your life here right now. Maybe you've even had this conversation with a close family member a spouse that says, look, I get your faith is important to you here right now, but, but you're not going to get all religious on me, are you? Or maybe one of your, your teenagers that's pushing back in a variety of different ways, and you are trying to lean in and make some changes spiritually in your life. And maybe even your teenager kind of says back to you, says, look, you haven't cared about this for the last 15 years. Like, why are you making this a big deal right now? Um, pleasing God, Joseph found, sometimes means disappointing other people. Um, the angel goes on to say it this way. It says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child within you. We read that was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And you will have a son and you were to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. No pressure, Joseph. Can you imagine? You were raising the very son of God. You were raising someone that 
somehow, and Joseph probably didn't even realize at this point, like, what does that mean? I know, like, my kids promised to be a king, but how to save people from their sins? I don't know. Um, All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet, which was the prophet Isaiah. It says, look, a virgin will conceive a child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, say it with me, God with us, that God will be with us. And when Joseph woke up, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. This guy, instead of waiting for the year-long engagement, said, right now, man, I've heard this message. God's made this clear. I am going to, I'm going to take Mary home to be my wife. And I'm going to walk this journey, and some others may not understand, but I'm going to walk this journey. And and Mary, you and I, man, let's just trust God. And let's be a part of what what God's going to have for our future here together. Um, His choice there ultimately as he kind of walked through this time kind of boiled down to this, that, that he had to, originally he was going to to push off the engagement, look, it'll just be, it's just going to be a lot less complicated. Let's call this thing off. But his choice became clear after the angel came there that he's going to move forward with this and ultimately that I'm going to care more about what God says than what people think. Amen? And I'm telling you that can be so profoundly impactful in your life and faith. It can help to shape. When when you believe that that's true, that will be a game changer for you, whether you are on a middle school or high school campus, and you are, and you are saying, look, I am, I'm excited about my future, the plans that God has for me. I care more about what God thinks than what one popular kid on the campus thinks that I should be doing here right now. Um, This makes all the difference in the world when you are navigating through your young adult years and you are making choices and decisions and you're establishing yourself on your own and you're trying to figure out like what are going to be my priorities and what do I get after and what do I do in life. It's true in every season of your life in faith when you are retired and deciding like I've got more freedom in my life and what am I going to do here right now? What am I going to live for when I now have more choices in freedom than I've ever had before. What what Joseph came face to face with there was was that very real moment for him there to be able to say, hey, as I walk through this door, as I step into this now, man, I've got to trust and care more about what God thinks than what other people think. And, and this is a, a journey that you will experience in your life in different ways in different times. Now, I even remember for me along the way in my journey, a, a couple of different friends that, that said to me as a pastor and as a leader to be able to say, hey, Nate, I think that you've got to grow a little bit thicker skin right now if you are going to be the pastor and the leader that God has called you to be. There will always be some criticism that goes with your work and with your calling. There will be moments for you where you will lean into um, a choice, something that you are navigating personally or maybe with your family where where this just comes into focus, where you find yourself thinking, man, the rest of my family is not going to understand if we set this as a priority or we get after this in this way. Joseph realized, just as you will in moments along the way, there will be some moments in your life in faith where, where God is calling you to live by faith to be able to trust in him. And what Joseph experienced... As, as I shared some of those different things, some of the, the challenges, some of the pressure that he would face in his context and in that society there, that living for God, there will be times for you as well, invites criticism and it will require trust. Amen? Uh, you might have, for instance, um, 
Even in your workplace, there might be something, let's say that you travel a lot for business, and let's say you're a guy that spends a decent amount of time on the road, and, and you travel to a city, you're maybe going to a convention, and you're staying in a hotel, and you're in a different place, and all of a sudden, at the end of a day, a few of the other guys at your company say, hey, man, we're going to go over to a strip club in town. Let's just look, come on, let's go with us. And we're going to head over here. You know, I've been to this place before. There's a good place here in town on the other side of downtown. And, and maybe you've even gone in the past with them before. But now there's something that God's been doing in your life and your faith. And just say, man, that's not how I want to roll. And I want to honor God in a different kind of way in my life. And you take the risk there that night to say, hey guys, look, I, I just, I, I can't be a part of that. Look, wh whatever you guys want to do, that's fine, but I'm not going to go. And, and you know that, that maybe for some of them, the next day, they're just going to bust your chops and they're going to make fun of you as a guy that's too good to hang out with the boys anymore. Maybe you're, you're getting together with some girlfriends and you're, you're drinking some wine and you're hanging out and, and just having a, a good time there together and and all of a sudden the conversation turns to being very critical about some of the other people's husbands or, or boyfriends. And, and as that conversation is rolling there right now, it just becomes uncomfortably quiet for you because as you've been walking this journey, there's something God's convicted you in that you want to really honor your spouse and, and you're just not gonna chime in and join in and be a part of that conversation. And, and you hold back and all of a sudden it just feels different with some of those friends. Like you're just not participating in some of the same things you did before. And maybe there's that fear for you that you know, look, if I'm not a part of this and I'm not willing to be one of the group or part of the gang anymore, maybe the next time I'm not gonna get invited. And some of these are good friends and people that I love. Maybe you've had moments for you where where you've just been a little bit hesitant to share your faith, to speak up about, about what you believe or, or who you are, or maybe there's some places in life where like, hey, I'm willing to do it here, but, but maybe like in your workplace there, just think, man, if I, if I let other people know that I'm a Christian, that might actually like hold me back. I just know my boss is not a Christian. Maybe I'm not gonna get the next invite to be a part of the next project, to be a part of the next thing. But there is something that is so profound as you think about some of the challenges of what it means sometimes to live out your faith. What Joseph faced there before, what I shared earlier, was some social stigma. You might say, check, there's some time where that's, that's true for me. Um, in some parts of the world, it, it means that you might end up in jail or you might, you, your house might get taken away if you go public as a Christian. We don't deal with that kind of pressure here, but but there are some social things sometimes, um, especially as the world more and more around us believes less and less of some of the, the way of Jesus. Um, we talked about for family or for friends, sometimes you might have even people that are close to you that just can't understand why you believe what you do or, or why uh, your faith is being lived out the way that it is. There can be even a financial impact sometimes you may make a decision and personally say, I really want to step forward. I want to be generous. I want to tithe. I want to, I'm going to take some steps of faith in my life. And, and maybe that's been a topic of conversation with your kids or your family because you're not spending as much money as you used to on some other things or with friends where it's just not as easy to go hang out and go on the next trip or next vacation or the next thing that you, you so often jumped into before. What Joseph discovered there is that living for God can sometimes invite criticism and it will require trust. But what God has on the other side of trusting him is so good for you, amen? Think about some of our, our young people here at, at Summit, some of our teenagers who have said, look, I, I wanna make some choices I want to save myself for marriage. It's going to change the way that I date. And there are some ways that I want to honor God personally in my life and, and do that. 
And there will come probably some moments for them when all of a sudden somebody that they're dating says, look, if you really loved me, why aren't you willing to take that step and go here with me? Living for God invites criticism and requires trust. But the incredible hope and good news of Jesus is this, that the life that Jesus offers is so much better. That, that what God invites us into when Jesus says, come and follow me, that you get to be a part of his family. You not only get to share in heaven one day, but even right now, the promise of Christmas is that God is with us. Amen? that God is with you. And that is why, especially if you are someone there that wrestles with what other people think and you are a people pleaser, taking this step in your life to say, I'm gonna care more about God might be the one thing, not just in your faith, but in every part of your life that sets you free, that allows you to find some courage and hope and confidence about your future in ways you never have before. It's why in Hebrews chapter two, we are invited there to say, look, if, if you want to discover the life and the plans that God has for you, fix your eyes on Jesus. Read it with me. The author and perfecter of our faith. It says this, who for the joy set before him what, what it says for Jesus, and I want you to catch this because I think it's helpful and a great reminder for us that the joy that God set before Jesus, it was something that propelled him, moved him forward. For the joy set before Joseph, after the angel came, he's like, I'm in. Mary, let's go. I don't have all the answers, but I know it's going to be good. Um, Man, let's see what God's going to do. For the joy set before Jesus, it says that he endured the cross, all the pain that it would mean, the personal suffering, the injustice of it. Jesus never did anything wrong. And yet he was, when he went to the cross, treated like a, a common criminal and publicly humiliated. It says this, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Jesus took that shame for you, amen? And, and because of that reason, he now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. See, the promise and the hope that Jesus has for us is that as we trust him by faith, that God opens up doors in your life, in your family, and for you personally to embrace that adventure on the other side. And his promises are so good. But sometimes we have to remember that because there will be moments where it's hard what your parents or what your kids or what somebody else might think of you. Um, but it's also a good reminder for us as we fix our eyes on Jesus that, that in the story of Joseph, we can be reminded that God comes to dwell with people, not just that make all the right decisions, but God comes to dwell with people just like you and me that often don't get it right. Because the promise that Jesus makes is this, that I'm not just with you and that you get to be my son and daughter and that I'm gonna be a part of this with you if you make all the right decisions, if you do all the right things. Joseph was ready to break it off and call off the engagement the promise of Jesus, the hope of Christmas, our Savior that was born that saves us from our sins, what God says to you, there will be times where you do get this right and you say, man, how did I even have the courage and the faith to do what I did? There will also be moments where you totally mess it up. And in those moments, have the confidence to know that Jesus is your Savior and that's why he came. He's not just your Savior, in the moments where you win and get it all right, but he's your savior in the moments where you don't as well, amen? And so my challenge to you is this, and let's embrace this kind of faith that Joseph had to live for the approval of God 
rather than for people. Doesn't mean you always get it perfect and always get it right, but there will be some defining moments for you in your life along the way where I believe God will teach you, train you, and show you some incredible freedom for your future as you understand this to be true. In fact, I want to pray for you here today, so let me have you stand up, and, and I want to share this scripture passage with you here today as I pray over you as well. Paul was an incredible apostle, a fearless man of faith, someone who it's just seemed like, like courage came natural to him. But, but if you look at the life of Paul, read the New Testament, so much of what he wrote, there are moments where you just realize, man, he cared so deeply about Jesus and his mission that, that he just didn't care a lot about what other people thought. And in Galatians 1 verse 10, uh, he even says this very specifically. He's like, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people. Say it with me, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Let me pray for you today. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I thank you for the men and women of faith who have gone before us, like Paul, who made it his goal to live for your approval and to serve you. People like Mary and Joseph that trusted you in incredible ways when they couldn't see the outcome, but they knew that you were in control. Lord, I pray for every man and woman here today. I pray for every student. I pray that you would fill them with faith, so much so that, that there is just boldness and courage that comes out of them when they find themselves in a spot where they've got to figure out, am I going to live for God right now or for, for other people, what they think? Lord, I pray that this Christmas you would do a wonderful thing in families and people. Give us joy, give us hope, and I pray that you would lead the way in Jesus' name, amen.